solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you All right, now that the uh, witness has been sworn, I'll just inquire briefly. Um, Mr. Daniels, did you previously review or view or listen to any of the trial testimony in this case? No. All right, thank you for your response. When you're being questioned, please make verbal responses and try to avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you so we can keep the record clear. With that in mind, then, Mr. Wood, you can inquire on direct. Thank you. Mr. Daniels, can you state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Steve Daniels, D-A-N-I-E-L-S. What is your occupation? I'm a special agent with the FBI. Okay. Uh, and how long have you worked for the FBI? Approximately 25 years. Uh, and are you, do you have a specific, um, specific job or duty in the FBI? I'm a special agent, and then an alternate duty is uh, I'm a senior team leader for the evidence response team. Okay. Um, is the evidence response team sometimes referred to as ERT? Yes. Okay. So if I say ERT, we're both tracking that that's evidence that, response that team. That means evidence response team, yes. Okay. And how long have you worked with the evidence response team? Um, I kind of have an off and on over those 25 years with ERT. Um, so I'll just say approximately 13 to 15 years. Okay. And have you, do you, do you or have you held any supervisory roles in the ERT? I'm currently the senior team leader for ERT and I've had that role for 10 years. Okay. Other than the FBI, have you had any other law enforcement experience? I have not. Okay. Uh, let's talk about ERT real quick. What uh, What is the primary role of ERT? So the evidence response team uh, kind of handles the forensics for the FBI. So we're kind of like a CSI team. Um, and our all of our ERT members go back to Quantico, Virginia, and we get like an 80-hour basic training in how to process crime scenes or execute search warrants. Okay. So there's an 80-hour basic training. Is there any other training you do? Besides the basic uh, training that we receive at Quantico, Virginia, uh, after that, all of our members are offered other advanced trainings, and there's many of those. Have you participated in any other advanced trainings? Uh, the one that's relevant for today would be uh, the Human Remain Recovery course, and that's offered at the University of Tennessee. Uh, tell me a little bit about that course. How long is it? I want, if I remember right, it's about a week long training, so about 40 hours. And that's just kind of where you would learn how to recover human remains from different scenes. Okay. Do, what involvement, if any, did you have with a search on the Chad Daybell residence on June 9th and 10th of 2020? The evidence response team was asked, initially asked by a local FBI case agent to help come up with a search strategy uh, to, we would be executing a search warrant on June 9th and 10th of 2020 at the Chad Daybell property. Um, and that included a residence, outbuildings, and a three to four acre property. And one of the things we'd be looking for is human remains along with other evidence of a crime. Okay. Uh, what did you and your team do in preparation for that search? I was first notified that there would be a search warrant um, approximately a week prior to the search warrant execution. And that, so from that, the preparation phase would have involved talking to the local case, a FBI case agent, and then talking to uh, local police, Rexburg PD, police department, um, talking to uh, the evidence response team unit, and they're the unit that oversees uh, all the evidence response teams nationwide. And then we would have also talked to the FBI laboratory at Quantico, Virginia, and we would have come up with all kind of a team effort, come up with a kind of a search strategy or game plan as to how we would 
process or execute uh, this this search on the property. Uh, specifically, the the difficult part would be looking for human remains. Where would we find them? And I can go into more of that if you want. That's that's okay. We'll we'll get there. Um, when did you arrive on the Daybell property? So on June 9th of 2020, uh, just in the early morning hours. Okay. And what was the first thing uh, you instructed your team to do? Since we did have a week of preparation, I had approximately eight ERT members with me. And so for my eight ERT members, everybody was pretty much tasked with a role uh, before we arrived. So some of the things that ERT members would have done I would have had a photographer, uh, somebody that's going to take overall as-is photos of this property before law enforcement or ERT <coughs> has touched anything. We would have had somebody start a crime scene sign-in log so that we know who's coming and going from the scene. I, as the team leader, would have had a, a administrative worksheet or log. Um, and one of the things that I would have first done is done a preliminary survey. So I would have walked through the scene. Um, looking for areas of interest, things that we had already, some of those things we had already identified uh, during our week-long preparation. So we had some priority areas that we had uh, already noted. So were there specific areas on the property that you were uh, oriented towards? Yep, so we had, because we had a week-long um, preparation, we already had some aerial imagery, satellite imagery, um, of this property, so we kind of knew some items that might be located on it. One of them was a fire pit. We could see that from satellite imagery, so we knew that that would be an area of interest to us, so we already had an idea that that's an area we had to process. So we had two ERT members already designated once we got there to go start assessing that fire pit. Um, we had some telephone information from suspects involved in the case. Um, that showed where they were on the property um, from back in September of 2019. So we kind of had an idea as to their locations on that property, and we called that telephone ping information. So we had some general ideas as to where those persons were on the property, and we kind of had that mapped out. So we had some ideas as to where we could look potentially on this three to four acre property. We had a text message just from based on the investigation that kind of talked about a pet cemetery. So we didn't know where the pet cemetery was on the three to four acres, but once we got there, that was part of our assessment or preliminary survey was to say, hey, can we identify where the pet cemetery is located? Because there was a text message that talked about burying something in the pet cemetery. So that was an area of interest we needed to find. And then one of the telephone pings showed an area around a pond, like a northeast part of this pond that we wanted to go at least look at. Okay. Uh, so those were some areas you, you knew you wanted to look at, uh, but did your search include the entire property? Yes. So we didn't know if we would find anything in any of those areas. We just knew that that's kind of a starting point, but we indeed wanted to look at the entire three to four acres. Uh, we had noted on, on different aerial images, uh, different things, any any kind of discrepancies with the land, whether it's a well, a flower bed, um, sheds, outbuildings, the residence. So everything needed to be searched. Okay. Um, Agent Daniels, uh, in your preparation for testimony today, did you work with other members of the FBI to create an exhibit that detailed the work your team did on the Daybell property on June 9th and 10th of 2020? I did. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Well, I'm going to ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 171. A courtesy copy was provided to the court this morning, and uh, counsel received a copy last week.
Agent Daniels, do you recognize uh, State's Exhibit 171? I do. What is that? It's a thumb drive that contains the what we call the interactive uh, data. Okay. So uh, let's talk about that data. Uh, while you were on uh, the Daybell property on June 9th and 10th, uh, were there photographs taken of the scene that day? Yes. And as a supervisor, would you go back and review those photographs? Yes, I reviewed all the photo photographs that were taken that day for those days. Okay. Do you know approximately how many photographs were taken? I would estimate that there were five to 700 photos. Okay. Um, did you include some of those photographs in that exhibit? Yes. Uh, and have you reviewed it? Did you review the photographs that you put in that exhibit? Yes. Uh, having been on the ground on June 9th and 10th, 2020, can you say that the pictures that are in that exhibit are fair and accurate representations of what you witnessed those days? Yes. Okay. Uh, are you aware of what a ferro scanner is? Yes. Can you explain for the jury what a ferro scanner is? So a ferro scanner is a tool, a measuring tool that the crime scene team, ERT, uses when we process our crime scenes. And the ferro scanner, it has a laser and the laser is directed by a, a mirror, and the ferro scanner sits on a tripod, and it rotates in uh, 360 degrees. And wherever you put the ferro scanner, it'll take a scan using that laser, and it can take a thousand, thousands of different measurements of that area. Okay. Uh, was there a ferro scanner on the ground with your search team on June 9th and 10th? Yes, there was. Um, and is it fair to say that that ferro scanner took thousands of points of data? Yes. Okay. And it, uh, and it took approximately 40 scans, 360 degree scans during that day, those days. Okay. Um, does the exhibit you prepared, this interactive exhibit, utilize ferro scan information for the burial sites of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? Yes, it does. Have you reviewed those that ferro scan data for those two sites? Yes, I have. Uh, is the ferro scan information on your exhibit for those two sites a fair and accurate representation of the ferro scan data collected on June 9th and 10th? Yes. Agent, what is a total station tool? So a total station is another measuring tool that we'll use to process our crime scenes, and the the difference is the total station is kind of a point to point. It'll it'll shoot in one item of evidence or or a perimeter, so one point that you want to measure in versus like a, a thousand points of measurement. And the difference is another difference is um, we can tell it what to measure in. So if we want one specific item on a crime scene to be measured in, we can kind of dictate what that. Uh, point we want to measure in is. So hopefully that explains it. it. Is it similar to a surveyor's tool? Yes. So if you've seen people on the side of a road doing construction, um, it's it's like that. It has a, It also has a tripod um, on one end, and then on the other end there's usually a person holding a pole with a prism attached, and it'll shoot a laser to that person holding the pole and it'll measure with a laser out to that one point. And then the total station, another difference is the total station is good at measuring um, great lengths, and the ferro is better at measuring things that are close up. Was a total station tool used during the search of the Dayville property on June 9th and 10th? It was. Uh, was any total station data used in your, in, in your exhibit? It was. Have you reviewed the total station data that's provided in that exhibit? Yes. Is it a fair and accurate representation of the total station data that was collected on June 9th and 10th? Yes. Okay. Detective, you're not a detective. Agent, sorry about that. Yes. Um, did you use a photo taken by a drone on June 9th in your interactive exhibit? Yes. Uh, you stated earlier that you did a survey of the property at the commencement of the search, correct? Correct. Uh, is it fair to say that you are familiar with the property, its landmarks, and its general layout? Yes. Uh, have you seen other aerial photos of the Daybell property? Yes. Uh, based on uh, 
based on you being there, based on you seeing other aerial photographs you know are associated with that property, is the drone photo you used in your exhibit a true and accurate representation of what you witnessed on June 9th and 10th of 2020? Yes, it is. Okay. So, Agent, I've, I've asked you about uh, photographs, feral scan data, t a total station tool data in this photo. Are these... Uh, uh, is information from those different tools collected in your exhibit? Yes, it is. Uh, was this exhibit created to summarize the voluminous data, recordings, and photographs that were collected on June 9th and 10th? Yes, it was. Uh, would it aid you and be more convenient to provide your testimony uh, to use that exhibit uh, than providing every single photograph, ferro scan data, and total station data collected that day? Yes, it would. Your Honor, based on... Idaho Rule of Evidence 1006, the state moves to admit Exhibit 171. Any objection? Yes. <clears throat> All right. What's your objection, counsel? Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to um, volunteer an aid of an objection. You may. So, Agent, uh, you indicated that uh, this exhibit uh, that the state is trying to introduce here uses feral scan data and total station data and uh, drone photos, is that right? Correct. Okay. What training do you have as far as the ferro scan data? Do you have any training on that? Uh, just what my total station and ferro operators provide us. So we'll do quarterly trainings within our division, and they'll mm -hmm. give us trainings on those items. So you testified today that you know this to be true and accurate, uh, depictions of the ferro scans. How do you know that? I mean, if you don't have any training on ferro scans. Objection misstates the testimony. That's sustained. But you can still answer as it relates to any foundational question for training on that device. So in order to create this interactive, I sat down with our total station operator and our um, ferro scanner operator who were at the Daybell uh, property on June 9th and June 10th, and they went over what was in this interactive with me and showed me the data that was in this uh, interactive. And then I sat down with, or phone called in, Teams meeting uh, with the Operational Projects Unit at FBI Laboratory. The individual who created this interactive and just kind of confirmed all of the information that was put into this interactive. Okay. So who was it that was operating the ferro scanner? Uh, S.A. Brian Kimball. And who was operating the total station? Christopher Duham. Could you spell that name, please? Christopher, last name Duham, D-U-H-A-M-E. And are both of those guys on your team? They're both evidence response team members, yes. Okay. And who was operating the drone? It was a Rexburg PD employee, and I'd have to look at the ERT paperwork to find out, remember who that name is. Okay. But you reviewed the drone footage? Yes. Okay. And did you compare that with any satellite footage or any... Uh, other footage that would give an aerial view? Did you ever fly over the area to see if that was accurate? Uh, during that week of preparation, we had a satellite image was provided to me by the FBI laboratory. Um, I can't remember the dates of, like, it, whether it was Google Maps or who, whatever imagery it was. I don't remember the dates of those images. But, yes, I've seen aerial images of the, of the property. And it's substantially similar to the drone photos? It was fairly similar, yes. Okay. You indicated that you had a Skype or some sort of a Zoom meeting with Operational Projects Unit. Is that right? Yes, sir. Who, who, who is that? Uh, I'd have to get the name for you. The first name was Raya, R-A-Y-A, and I'd have to... I'd have to look and see what the last name was. Is this a man or a woman? A woman. Okay, so what did she do for you that gave you more confidence in this particular 
uh, PowerPoint or presentation that you're going to give? She's the person that actually put this interactive together at the FBI laboratory. Okay. And she works for the FBI as well? Correct. Have you ever met her before? Not in person. But you've done Zoom meetings or, or correct kinds of meetings? Yeah, correct. Okay. Phone calls, Teams meetings. Teams meeting, that's what you said. Sorry. All right. Uh, based on those uh, responses, Judge, I have no, I have no objection to the, uh, to the uh, exhibit. All right. Ed, exhibit one seven one then is admitted. Your Honor, may I publish? Yes. working. It just takes a minute to spin up. I'm going to try and restart this. Detective, do you recognize this title screen? I do. I'm s Agent, I apologize again. Agent, oh, do you recognize this title screen? I do. Uh, can you just briefly describe what's on this screen? It's just an overall showing the area, and in the, the bottom portion of the screen, it shows where Lori Vallow and Alex Cox residents are with a dot, that red dot, in Rexburg, the, the city of Rexburg. And at the very top is the area that I'm going to be focused on, and that just shows where the Dayville property is um, in Fremont County. Okay. Uh, Agent, is there a pointer on the... Oh. Yes. So down here is where the Lori Vallow residence, the apartment, and Alex Cox apartment are, and then the Dayville property where we executed the search warrant on June 9th and 10th of 2020 are. And in the morning of June 9th, we, we kind of stayed, the team kind of staged at a Salem church uh, prior to the search warrant execution while local law enforcement uh, made safe the residents. And I think that's all I need to, uh, north, if you'll notice, is towards the top of the screen, just with the compass there. 
might help us. I'll point that out once we kind of zoom in to the property. So do you recognize this property? Yes. So this is the Chad Daybell property and everything on here, um, the, the main residence, a bunch of outbuildings, chicken coop, small shed, uh, big garage, fire pit. This is the known fire pit, so one of our priority areas to search. This ends up being uh, JJ's burial site one, burial site one. This ends up being Tylee's burial, burial site two. Agent, you spoke about doing a, a preliminary site survey once you got out there. So once the team arrived, we, ERT, kind of parked our vehicles in this, this main back driveway. Uh, our photographer kind of did overall photos, uh, doing a counterclockwise motion through the property this way because we knew our priority areas were all going to be kind of on this side of the re of the property, the east side of the property. So overall photo photographs were taken this way. Crime scene sign in log started. I start kind of following the photographer, um, doing a preliminary survey of this area. And all that is is a walkthrough, a walkthrough of the, the crime scene. What am I seeing? I start doing assessments in my head. Uh, I know where the fire pit is. I had two people going to the fire pit anyway to start some assessments of their own ERT people. Um, so they're going to start assessing that. But I'm going to start doing some assessments too. What does the fire pit look like? Can I determine where the pet cemetery is? Um, and then gradually work my way up to the pond to see what's over on this side. Okay. Um. Were you part of a search of the house that day? Yes. Okay. What do you see here? This is one of the ERT photos that we took, and it's just showing an overall photo of, of the front door of the residence. And... This, what's there's a, a photo number assigned to, the, to these can you state the number and, and then briefly describe what the, the photo shows so this is photo number 492 um, one thing to note though is sometimes these photo numbers don't match what uh, the ERT team's photo numbers are okay so I just want to make a little clarification and then the photo this is just showing a vantage point photo so from the upper bedroom of the residence which was right there this is just a a photo showing that from this bedroom on the upper story of this this how the house you could look out and oversee where jj's burial was right at the base of that tree basically behind out over that area can you describe what was you saw in this photo? And this is that same, from the same window, just a different view. This is facing east, just overlooking. Uh, Tylee's burial is going to be just on the other side of this bigger garage or barn. So that's just a, just a vantage point showing what, what the residents could see. And this was from that same upper bedroom, correct? Same, same upper bedroom window right about there on the top. And where is this located? And now this is the kitchen window, and it's going to be somewhere in that vicinity. And so it's just showing, just kind of from, from these windows along the east side of the residence, looking towards where eventually we'll show you some of the, the burial sites, but it's looking towards the burial sites, that, that east side of the property just kind of what the residents would have had a view of. So this is more towards the fire pit and where Tylee's burial site will be. And that's the opening of the that, that garage right there. You can see that garage right there. And we'll show you some photos of the garage. That'll be important in a little bit. Okay. And then where was this photo taken? 
and there's two bedrooms along this this side. There's a southeastern bedroom down here, a window right here, and then just north of it, there's another bedroom. So this is from that bedroom, the second bedroom from the southeast corner. So it's just right about there, just showing the view that that bedroom window would have of the property facing those burials. So up there would have been JJ's burial, and over here would have been Tylee's burial and the fire pit. Agent, I'm gonna we're gonna discuss the fire pit. Um, can you describe what what we're looking at in the photo that's been listed as 27? So this is just one of our entry photos or overall photos. So what's important about this is we haven't touched the area. Um, so doing that quick assessment, right as we came around the corner of the of the property, this right here is a little statue of a dog. And that allowed me to kind of make a quick assessment. Well, that's probably where a pet cemetery is. And then if you look at the ground, I like this photo because it, it obviously when you're there in person, it looks a little better. But this one at least allows you to see kind of um, some disturbances in the ground or the ground just looks a little different right here. So standing out there, I could see kind of what I thought in front of that statue. It looked like there could be a little burial. And then in this whole area, there just seemed like there could be some other depressions or disturbances in this ground right here. So initial, so pretty, pretty quickly, I just made a little square around this area and said, this is what we're going to call our initial pet cemetery area. And so fairly quickly, I was able to get a team to start processing this area for the pet cemetery. And then you can see in the background, we've got our fire pit ring over here, some debris. And then in a little bit, you'll see some uh, fluorescent streamers that start to show up. And we can talk about that in another picture. But, but those will just be some grids that we start setting up. When you say grids, what do you mean by grids? So a lot of times when we do search, especially in a, in, on a big property, there's not really any reference points out there. So we like to establish some kind of a grid system so that later for when we go to court or I'm trying to show a jury what we did on a property, um, we can kind of make it make sense to everybody. And if we find some evidence in that grid, we can kind of give you a little bit better detail as to on this big property, right, here's where we found it. And so hopefully we'll see if that makes sense in a minute. And so this picture just shows a little bit trying to make sense of, so our, our two people that went over to that fire pit to assess the fire pit, one of our concerns was this was June 9th um, of 2020 and our time of interest that these two kids went missing was like September of 2019. And we didn't know is the fire pit today, did it look like that back in uh, September of 2019? And so what, while they're assessing, they went over to that fire pit and started assessing, they started seeing ash on the ground outside the fire pit. So that's what they made their grid. They made the grid go extend beyond the actual fire pit ring. And that grid is basically going around the entire area where they saw like ash on the ground. So that's what made them determine how to build that grid system. And then while they were building that grid system, they noticed a little silver charm. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And Agent, what, uh, describe what you uh, saw that day that's, that's listed as photo 33. And so this is just a close-up photo of the fire pit ring as we saw it. So before we've touched it, this is what it looked like. Center block ring. These are just some branches that were in it, and we haven't done anything to it yet. And then in a minute, I'll talk about kind of how we would process that. 
But that one's just to give you an idea of what it looked like when we first got there. And now we've, proce we're start we've started processing. That initial layer's gone. And how we want to process the fire pit is we just want to go layer by layer down. And this is going to take a sifting process. So our team, it's going to take a team. So we're going to start using rakes to rake through it to see if we notice anything. We're going to use shovels. We're going to scoop the soil, debris, whatever's in there into buckets. And we have a pit that I, I, we chose this one just because it showed a bucket. But that's the kind of bucket we would use to scoop the debris in. And then a little bit away from here, we will put down a tarp, so a clean tarp. And then we'll have like these wooden um, sifter screens. And they'll have like a mesh wire screen on them. And then a team member will pour the soil onto that mesh screen while another team member is shaking it back and forth. And so the soil falls through. And then you try to catch any potential evidence pieces on top, whether that's potential bone, whether it ends up being jewelry, um, or anything else that could be significant. And then our team members will catch that and decide if it's evidence or not. Uh, and to your knowledge, were any items collected for evidence from that fire pit on June 9th and 10th? Yes. So, so from the fire pit on this day, from all the grids, um, quadrants on this day, uh, we collected suspected bone fragments. And I think we have a picture that will show you those, those uh, quadrants in a second. So from all of them, we got suspected bone fragments. We got um, suspected organic material from this fire pit. And we don't, at the time we're, when we're processing it, we don't know what that is. But we just see it and we're like, hey, this looks like it could be organic material. So we'll collect it and then somebody else has to send it to a lab to try to verify that. And then an important piece that we found out of here uh, was, a, was a chain. Pura Vida chain comes out Agent, of this. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna stop you, and I'll I'll ask some questions and, and uh, as we go through. But uh, were there any other items collected from this fire pit that day? There was just the miscellaneous pieces of cloth and fabric. Um, and again, at the time, we don't necessarily know at this point from our standpoint is this important, not important. But when we see those things, we just collect them. Okay, thanks. And Agent, what, what are we seeing in, in this photo? This is just a photo to show you as it's, you know, we're probably near, nearing completion of the processing the fire pit. So it's just showing how it's getting, we're, we're, it's getting cleaned up. And you can kind of see how the rake's been gone, gone through there. And then an important thing to note for the fire pit was just as the team was processing this fire pit, they could smell like the, the, the chemical smell or accelerant smell was strong. And that was something just to, to remember. Um, it, it was almost overpowering at times. And people were talking about, you know, do we need to wear masks, like, so they could smell that? And we did take a soil sample from that um, fire pit so that that could potentially be tested later, too. OK. And then from the sifting operation in the fire pit, this Pura Vida chain was collected. Agent, when you say Pura Vida, what does that mean? So on this, on this silver part of the chain right there, that's the description on it. So it says Pura Vida okay. on that chain right there. And was that located actually in the fire pit? That was inside the fire pit, and it was collected f while doing that sifting operation that I described before. And then this, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just, uh, Agent, can you describe what we're seeing in photos 46? And then this is just a longer shot of the silver charm we found. I know it's hard to see, but that's because it's a long, long shot of it. Um, and it's, it was, it, it was found kind of in this area over here. Um, so here's the fire pit. It was found quite a distance over here. Agent, was this an area where the, uh, the total station was used to make measurements? Yes, it was. Are those those measurements? Those are those measurements. OK. So when we talked earlier about the team getting there, they created, the team created this grid. And, the, and these squares become, become the quadrants. 
and they created this because they found that ash on the ground in these areas. And again, thinking, well, in 2019, this fire pit potentially wasn't there. What if it was over here? But we found all the ash outside of this fire pit in these areas. So the teammates, the team members, they're the ones that created these grids. While they were setting up the grids, that's when they noticed that silver charm right there. So it just caught their attention. And it's just one of those things at first. And that was actually fairly early in the day that we saw that because that's when the grids were getting set up. But it's just like, hey, that doesn't, that doesn't fit. Why is that way out here in the middle of this field? Okay, Agent, is, what are we seeing in this next photo? So now we're just doing closer up views. Usually we start with a longer view of a piece of evidence. And then we do medium shots, close up shots, and close up with scale shots. And that's what you're about to see. So that's just a, a closer, a, a closer view of the last yeah, photo. closer up shot of it. And these are what all still this? these are all still with it in place. Okay. And now we've moved it. And now we just put added the scale to it. Okay. And then oh, and then over on the side over here, we didn't get a, a specific measurement of the charm. But what we did do, because we had our total station, the, divide, the measurement tool that can measure specific points, our, we use our total station when we do grids in the middle of fields and whatnot where there's no reference points. We use total station to map in any grids we make. So whether it's a burial and we do, we'll, we'll map in with total station the specific points of that burial so we know where Tylee's burial is on that property. And then we use total station to map in each one of these corners of our grid so we know where that is. And then we total stationed in each end of the center blocks. And that's why those center blocks are kind of all noted on there. And so now we could potentially take a measurement from this, uh, our, our grid point is what we did. We took that measurement to one of the center blocks of the fire pit to at least give everybody the approximate. So that's from our grid the northeast corner of our grid to one of the center blocks of the fire pit. So we at least have an approximate distance as to where that charm was. But that's not a measurement to the charm. Okay. Uh, and that's just the same charm uh, placed over some paper? Correct. Okay. Your Honor, I'm about to move on to an another section. I wonder if this would be a time to take the mid-afternoon break. I think it would be a good time for that, Mr. Wood. <coughs> All right, we'll go ahead and take our mid-afternoon break for 20 minutes or so. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. You can have the jurors brought in.
Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, we'll go back on the record. KCR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. Mr. Wood is in cross or uh, direct examination of your witness, Mr. Daniels. If you'd like to continue with direct, you may. Thank you. Agent Daniels, uh, just before we broke for a break, you had testified about items that were found in the fire pit, correct? Correct. Uh, when items went. What happened to those items? All evidence items seized at the end of the both days were turned over to the Rexburg Police Department. Okay. Um, and was there a, a log of that kept? There was. Okay. Uh, Agent, can you, we're going to talk about the location where Tylee Ryan was found. Um, can you describe uh, what you witnessed uh, in relation to photo 218? So this photo here is showing, there's that dog statue that we saw earlier when the uh, land, it was kind of an overall photo we saw earlier. And this one shows, this was kind of that initial area that I called the pet cemetery. And now the tractor, the backhoe, has already excavated that initial area in front of the dog statue. And there were two animal remains that were found, a dog that was right in front of the statue, and then a cat remains were found approximately somewhere over here. Um, no other human remains were found in this initial area. And at this point, the backhoe is it would extend that arm out and then it would kind of pull back that arm towards it towards the tractor and so it's just kind of excavating this area and that where the tractor is at is north of where this initial pet cemetery is so right now that tractor is excavating <laughs> north of the initial pet cemetery area here uh agent was there a reason you used a backhoe at this point, since we hadn't found anything in this initial area, and, and we did use the tractor here also, but first off, um, our process, and I guess I should need to describe that process. So the process we used for this pet cemetery, um, where I had seen this dog statue, in front of that dog statue was some disturbed areas that I thought could be burial sites. So we initially had a team pro start processing that area, and we just wanted to kind of go layer by layer. Sorry about that. It's all right. We'll get that fixed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right. Um, I had asked you why you're using a backhoe, if you want to continue answering that. So, so initially to process er this area, we started with hand tools. And we started by processing where we thought that pet cemetery area was with hand tools. And we kind of wanted to go layer by layer down. And we found the animal remains by using hand tools. And then once we didn't find any human remains. We started using the backhoe just to save time and try to find, see if there was something there. And once we excavated deeper in that initial area, we just had to start expanding um, to try to clear more, more ground. And that was essentially why we started using the backhoe, just to cover more area. Okay. And tell us what you observed in the photo that's been designated 222. And so as that tractor was excavating to the north of that initial pet cemetery area, this is one of the first bone pieces 
that, that became excavated and it's kind of a vertebrae, it's a vertebrae piece. And at this time is when we stopped using the backhoe. We couldn't tell at this time if this were, was human remains, but at this time, besides the bone being found, I could smell an odor that I could associate with human remains decomposing. And so between this bone being found and there was another, a second bone that was found also, and that odor that I can associate with human decomposition, the decision was made not to use the tractor anymore. And in this air, this new area where these bones were found, that's what we started excavating, which is hand tools. And, and Detective, you, you talk about this smell. Um, you've been involved in previous uh, searches for for human beings, correct? For correct. deceased? Correct. Uh, and and is, it a, is there a specific smell to you of, of a decomposing body? Yes. Okay. And just, I'm sorry, just to, just to clarify, it was around the time you found this bone that you started smelling that. Yes. Okay. So as we were assessing this bone and a second bone, that's when that smell of decomposition, we could smell that, that smell. And that's when the decision was made not to use the tractor anymore and to start processing this area uh, with hand tools. And Agent, can you describe what we're seeing in this photo? And this photo, we really want to highlight these bricks that were uncovered by the tractor. And these bricks were in the vicinity of where we end up finding Ty Lee's grave site. And then this area right here ends up being, at this point we don't know, but this ends up being Ty Lee's grave site or what we call grave site number two on scene. And at this point, could you still smell that, that same odor? Yes. And the, the odor just, the odor just gets uh, more stronger as we start excavating this area. And can you describe what, what we're seeing in this photo? This, I think my laser pointer is giving out on me. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have another laser pointer. Killed it. Unless I've done something to it. Now it's working. Oh. Keep going with this one until you get down. This right here is another bone. And then this area just shows the area where we eventually determine is Tylee's um, burial site. Can you describe what we see in this photo? It's harder, hard to see in this one, but right there is a bigger white bone piece. And that was kind of the first, what ends up being the, the first pieces of Tylee that we excavate um, that's going to lead us to, to identify this as burial site number two where Tylee was buried. But at this point, we still didn't know on scene. But that bigger bone was a, a stronger indication that we're in, we're, in, we're in the right spot. And then we still see the, the uh, bricks that were near, you know, that were near where her burial site was and could have been placed on top of her remains. And Agent, what kind of tools were, uh, were being used you can kind of see some of the tools we had. So we had like a smaller little pick. And then at, that one's a, a trowel. So at this stage, we probably were using that trowel for the most part. And a lot of our excavations, we use uh, these little trowel tools. Okay. And uh, who, who at this point 
w- was helping at that site? Do you recall? On this on this site, besides the evidence response team members, we had about eight. We had Rexburg Police Department members. We had Fremont County Sheriff's Department members. We had other uh, FBI employees helping on this scene. And then I, I would just refer everybody to the crime scene sign-in logs to see who else was on scene at this point. Okay. And what are we seeing in photo 255? So now we've excavated further. Here's that uh, white, bigger white bone that was in that last photo. And now we're just, we've excavated a little, we're, we're attempting to excavate um, the, this, this human remains. And at this point, we still didn't have a determination that this was human remains. So we didn't know if this was animal or human. We're just trying to excavate it, get it out of the ground, and see if we had a forensic an- or we had an anthropologist on scene, and we were going to try to get her to determine if we if this was human or not. Okay, and I'm actually going to go back to the previous photo. Uh, as you were digging through this, did, was there anything remarkable to you about the soil uh, as you were digging? Oh, as we were trying to excavate this area, what we noticed was on the east side, so this lip right in here, this was harder for us to excavate through. And it had some kind of like a hard substance, similar to like a a concrete type substance. Um, And so we had a difficult time just kind of getting through those layers and I think there's a better uh, photo later. Okay. But we ended up, ultimately, we end up using the, the backhoe to kind of pull that kind of crusty layer away from these remains. And I think we'll have a better photo later to show. And, Judge, if, if we can get him a different laser pointer, I'm having a really hard time following what he's looking at and things that he's pointing to. All right. We do have an alternate one there. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll try to use this one again. It's, it's working now, but it might go out. And then the other things to point out from this photo is just the kind of how the ends are look charred, and then the pink flesh versus some charred flesh. Yeah, it's going. This laser pointer is going out again. It works for a second, and then it goes out. All right. If you'll give us a moment, I think we're working on it. Okay, there's a new one being delivered. It may take a few minutes. Maybe you can direct some additional questioning that doesn't require him to point for the moment, Mr. Wood. Okay. Agent, what uh, can you describe what you observed in this photo? We finally were able to remove the pieces that were in that last photo you saw. And this, these are the pieces, the first pieces of Tylee's remains that we removed at the end of our uh, day one, so June 9th of 2020. And these, and this is the point where we did identify them as human remains. And that became, that spot that we were just looking at all the photos, that became uh, burial site number two for us, or, or Tylee's burial site. And so at that point, we kind of established a new uh, perimeter around her burial site, and then came up with a better kind of excavation plan. Um, we can see it's on a blue tarp. Was that separated from the burial? Yeah, so we just had a tarp, you know, next to where the remains were excavated, put the pieces, you know, nearby, and then you can kind of see some of the charring on the remains some of the pink flesh that's still there. Okay. And that's one reason, I mean, this, this site, this burial was definitely the more difficult site for us to process um, just because of the way they were dismembered. We had a difficult time just trying to establish what are we, 
what are we looking at? How how was this burial done? So this was this this site definitely gave everybody that was trying to excavate it, you know, made it harder for us. It made it complex. Okay. Is this a moment? I think the bailiff's got oh. a new laser pointer here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for the help. Okay. And then this photo is. Uh, can you describe what's what you observe there? And this is just a closer up view of all of the initial pieces that were identified as Tylee. And you can see the bigger bones that were sticking out of the ground. And again, the hard part for us was just that initial excavation, like how do we, removing those was difficult. They didn't want to come out of the ground. And we, and we find out later it's because they were all just kind of melted together. And so it was just, it wasn't a standard um, excavation of remains. And by the next day, we kind of understand a little better why. Can, can you describe what's, what you observed in photo 262? This is after we had excavated those last pieces of Tylee. This is kind of what that burial site then looked like at the end of day one. So at the end of the day, you had uh, uh, taken portions out of the ground. Uh, what happened with those? So the coroner, uh, the pieces of Tylee that were on that blue tarp were then turned over to the coroner, so placed in a body bag, and then the coroner would have been responsible for removing those from the scene. And so this photo was taken at the end, you said of... So after that. those after those pieces were removed, then this is what the burial site then looked like. Okay. And can you describe what's uh, in this photograph? And basically at the end of June 9th, 2020, um, we ended our day having established, okay, this is where Tylee's remains are. This is burial site two. We, we got those pieces out, those first pieces that helped us identify, okay, this is where it's at. Um, the coroner took them. And so now we're kind of at the end of the day before we kind of continue excavating that burial now, now that we know, okay, that's what this is. Um, this is just our, where we left off for the day. So we're basically just secured everything for burial site two, where Tylee was buried, and we secured it all for, for that day. And now uh, Rexburg PD, Fremont County Sheriff's Office are gonna secure the scene overnight. And then the next day, June 10th, we're gonna come back and we'll process. Uh, one of the things we'll do is come back and prioritize processing, excavating the entire, all those remains that are still left in that burial. And approximately what time did you um, uh, secure the scene and then leave on June 9th? I'd have to look at our logs to be positive, but it was probably approximately 5 something p.m. Okay. And what is this a picture of? Now this is June 10th, 2020. So this is uh, an overall photo before we start the second day. So this is just how our scene is looking um, before we start processing. Okay. So where these orange stakes are located, those are the stakes that I put down just to indicate a new, this is now the perimeter around burial site number two where Tylee's remains were located. And now for today, we're going to excavate that just kind of a layer by layer down until we found all of the remains. And as you as you went through this excavation process, both on the 9th and the 10th, uh, were individuals sifting some of the soil that you were going through? Oh yes, the, so this picture is a good picture to show what our sifters look like, the wooden sifters. And on the inside of these sifters is a mesh wire screen. So that's a sifter right there. And then again, there's our buckets. Um, at each of the burial sites, there was a sifting operation 
at the fire pit, there was a sifting operation. And at JJ's uh, burial site, there was a sifting operation. Again, just looking for evidence, uh, pieces of human remains, uh, just to make sure we've, we've collected everything. And can you describe what we see in this photo? So now we've uncovered the burial site. And again, you can see this, the orange stakes kind of represent the perimeter of the new burial site number two, where Tyler's remains were located. And now today we're just gonna do kind of a layer, a layered approach, excavate down, um, take over all photos of each of these layers, stop and take the Pharaoh scans so that we can kind of see what that's gonna look like, the different measurements of the, of the to get the depths of where we're at. Um, if we see something significant, then we'll stop and take photos and scans. Um, so only really if we see something significant and the team leaders, someone like myself, can decide if we need to stop and take photos and scans. Um, and this one, was, again, this one was a difficult one, uh, and we'll, we'll probably see why in some other photos, because it just wasn't, I hate to say normal, but it just wasn't like a normal um, burial. Can you describe what we are observing in photo 368? So this is a good photo that shows kind of our difficulty we had excavating. So on the this this side here, you can see how we were able to kind of get uh, excavate deeper. And so this side's kind of deep. And then this side up here, we, we were hardly able to um, excavate and go go deep up here. And that's because this lip right here, and you can kind of see the texture to it, that's the side that had what I'm describing as kind of that concrete type material. So I can't say for sure if somebody was trying to cover this area, the burial, with some kind of concrete substance, but it was real close to where this burial is, right? Um, okay. we, we ended up taking samples of that substance. So we took a sample of that. And then on the, obviously, what, what stands out is at the bottom of this and this, it ends up being, we couldn't figure this out, like as we're hitting this top portion here, it's, we could tell it was kind of a organic material. But again, to, to your eye, as you're hitting this, you're like, what is this? This doesn't seem human. But what it ends up being is that is kind of the melted flesh of a human. Uh, but it took us a while to understand that or realize that. But this, this ends up being just a mass of a human, you know, dismembered, melted mass. And then finally, when you get to the bottom here, you kind of start understanding, oh, there's a melted green five gallon bucket. There's the skull finally down at the bottom. And those are really kind of, in my mind, what stood out finally, like, oh, wow, like that is a human. So this was kind of a, it took a while, even for investigators, it took a while for us to wrap our head around what what happened here? What is this? Can you describe what we see in this photograph? And so with that, that lip that was over here that was hard to break through or excavate, we ended up getting the tractor and kind of pulling back that lip of that crusty, hard material. And then we were finally able to kind of get in there and get deeper down. So we finally excavated around. And we ended up like kind of pedestaling out this human, these human remains. So it ends up being this, you, you can now see this, this, this pedestaled out human remains. And this is, what, this is what, ultimately, this is what we want to do. We want to be able to show you guys this. We want to be able to show everybody this is how these remains were buried, just to hopefully show the story of what happened here. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, you're fine. Um, oh, okay. Then what do we see in this photograph? And now we're just looking, now that we've got it kind of pedestaled, we've gone deeper on all sides of this, um, the human remains. I mean, this is what we were, what we were seeing. And you can still kind of see a skull at the bottom here, and then this melted plastic bucket here. And what is this a photo of? And so now we're just trying to get better photos of what we could identify, what made sense to us. And that was really the skull and then that bucket that was just melted. 
Is that just a different angle? Just a different angle, trying to get as low inside the barrel as we could, just to show what that, what's what did that look like when whoever did this, you know, put those remains in here. So just trying to show us, everybody, what, what was this like. And then it's, and then at some point, oh, oh, was, at, at some point we just had to make the decision. We've done, we've done everything we could to show that story of how these remains were put in there, buried. Um, and then in the decision we just made, we had to lift them out, try to lift them out. So when the, the team tried to lift those remains out, that's when they just fell apart. So we ended up that mass of melted, dismembered remains just kind of fell apart. And that this picture just shows what was, you know, what it looked like once the remains were removed. So now this is picture 400. Uh, once those remains were removed, what, what was done with them? There was a coroner's body bag was placed nearby. And so the remains were placed inside the body bag. And I think we'll have photos of that. And then uh, the anthropologist and coroner just kind of separated uh, those remains just so that they could kind of give us a, a better inventory as to what parts we had so that I would know how many parts, pieces are we still looking for or do we think we have everything that, that we need to take. Agent, I, I should have asked this earlier, but on June 10th, the second day of the search, do you recall approximately what time you began working on this site again? It would have just been the early morning. It would, probably would have been 7 something a.m. Okay. And on my logs, it would say the exact time. Okay. And do you recall approximately what time uh, that mass of remains was removed? I don't remember the exact time. And I, I probably noted it on my on my uh, logs that I keep, and I might I probably noted when the coroner took the remains on my logs, but I'd have to review those. Okay. What is in photo four zero three? So once we remove those remains, these are all the pieces placed on the coroner's body bag, and that's just showing them placed in there kind of as, as one mass. And for, photo 407, what are we observing here? So now it's just the close-up view. Once, once the anthropologist and coroner started separating the mass, now you could finally start seeing, you know, pieces that are at least identifiable. Okay, now it's looking more human. So now there's, you know, there's that skull. So now you're starting to see the P and that was part of that inventory. So we wanted them to do an inventory. I wanted them to do an inventory so that I knew, you know, are we looking for, it, could there possibly be another uh, burial? Are all the pieces uh, human remains in one burial? Or are we looking for another burial? So we wanted to kind of have that um, knowledge. Okay. And then these are those bricks that we've seen in other photos that were near where Tylee's remains were buried. So it was possible that these bricks were on top of her remains. Um, and we'll see in burial one when we get there, there were stones on top of JJ's remains. So it's possible these bricks could have been on Tylee's remains. So we wanted to collect these just in case. Okay, and that was in photo 414, correct? I'd have to go back and see what the number was on. on well, based number. based on your presentation, on your presentation, it's listed as photo 414, correct? Oh, correct. And then what are we seeing in photo 444? So at each of the burials, this, this is what we did. After we collected all of the human remains, the last step we did was we had the backhoe um, dig deeper in each of the, the burials and a little bit can go a little bit wider just to ensure we didn't have any other uh, human remains in that area. And that was especially important on JJ's burial because when we did 
when we had excavated JJ's was the first burial we found, and we wanted to make sure uh, Tylee's remains weren't in that same area. So that was just something we did extra to make sure there weren't any other remains. Okay. And was anything else located? No. Okay. Uh, we mentioned feral scanners earlier, uh, and you mentioned uh, feral scans at that specific site. Uh, can you tell us what we're seeing in this first photo? Yeah, so what I mentioned just a little bit ago, when we do these excavations, um, and it's kind of at the team leader's discretion, but wherever, whenever you see something significant, you want to stop and take photographs of that layer, and you want to do scans, like pharaoh scans, of that layer. And that's what this represents right here. So over on the, the right side, we have a photograph. So we call it layer A, and that's what this photograph is. And then we also, after the photographer took a photo, we had our pharaoh scanner set the, the on, set his tripet, tripod in the area, and then he took a pharaoh scan. And then the pharaoh scanner was the one that does the 360 degree, it turns around, and it takes thousands of measurements. And from those thousands of measurements, it creates this little image of the burial. And so that's what you're seeing down in the bottom. So when, now that we, since we've clicked on this, this photograph up here, which is this photograph, you're seeing this A right here represents the lowest depth of that image right there. And is it? Are we seeing the same thing here, just at a lower depth? Yep, so now he's clicked on picture B, which is your big picture here. And then now he's you're just seeing where that the lowest depth of this picture is represented in the graph down here. Okay, and so that's, at that, at that point, it's approximately a, a foot and a half, correct? Correct. And we didn't give any precise measurements. We just left it as one foot, two foot, three foot, and you just get an idea as to where that is. Okay. Layer C, uh, approximately how deep was that? So layer C is right there close to two feet deep. Okay, and then layer D? Just under the two foot mark. Okay, and then finally layer E, once it's removed, how deep was that? Yep, again, just under the two feet mark. Uh, Detective, as part of your search, uh, did uh, did you search the this shed and barn that's highlighted by the mouse? Yes. Okay. Uh, can you describe what we're seeing in photograph seventy nine? This is the garage door opening, or shed barn opening. And it's located right here on this side. So if you're walking from the residence over here, this is the first entryway you could go into to get into this area. Okay. And so here's the entryway. And as you walked in, what did you see? So one of the things, knowing that we're dealing with a burial, two burials, um, one of the things we're interested in is any tools. So if I was burying somebody, what tools would I need to do this? Or, in the case of Tylee, if I burn Tylee, if I dismember Tylee, what would I need to do that? So as I'm doing a survey of this garage, those are the tools that I'm looking for. So one of the things as we walked into this garage, from that open garage you saw in the first photo, there's a bunch of tools uh, up against the wall right here. And this is kind of an as-is photograph. So right now you're seeing the tools as they were on June 9th. Okay, and what are we seeing in photo 83? So now we've just turned, there's the open garage, here's those tools kind of as is up against the wall over there. Okay. And we'll gradually get clo closer up views of them. Are those those same tools? Yep, these are the same tools. Some of them are inside this purple little crate. 
And what's significant about this photograph? So this becomes more important. These are the tools that we chose to take as evidence. And obviously, because they could be the tools that I would use to bury somebody or do something harmful to somebody for this given scene. So we've got the pick, we've got shovels. And again, a lot of times I just base this on my experience. And unfortunately, these are the things that I train in. So I buried a lot of things. Um, but these, these tools in particular, you can see maybe they were used in a fire. Um, a lot of them are dirty. So those are clues. It's, and you stated you collected those as evidence? Yeah, these ones right here were collected as evidence. So that's why that photo is important. And what, uh, what was done with those after you collected them as evidence? I would have, we, we seized those. I seized those at the end of the day. And then I would have handed those to, um, released those to the Rexburg Police Department. Okay. And this is just a close up picture of the pickaxe. Okay. And this was one of the items you seized? Correct. And then you can see just some of the why we might have collected it, because it's showing some of the stuff, material, that could be on the pickaxe. Okay. And what was uh, in photo 239? These are two of the shovels that were seized. They were part of that group of, of tools in that last uh, couple photos back. Um, and again, this is just a closer up showing some of the, uh, how dirty they were potentially, you know, could be ash, could be other things on the shovels. So potential reasons to collect them. And these were, but so these were also collected as evidence and turned over to Rexburg? Correct. Or I should say the Rexburg police. Correct. Yeah. Excuse now, me. Now when you walked into that garage from the, the picture that showed the open garage. Your Honor, I'm going to object. There's no question here. I'll, so I'll ask a question. Uh, what did you observe in photo 451? So these are items that we collected as evidence from the garage. Okay. And again, uh, did you turn those over to the Rexburg police? Yes, at the end of the day, I would have seized these, and then we turned them over to the Rexburg police department. And these tools are the ones that, as you walked into the garage and you make a left, these are the tools that were in that area. Okay. And what is photo 237 of? This is just an overall photo, uh, photo of some of the tools in this west side of the garage right here. So not all of these tools were collected as evidence, but we just took an overall photo of some of the tools in the west side of that garage. Okay. And what, what did you observe in photo 437? These were just a group of tools, so an overall photo of tools that were in the southeast corner of the garage behind a door right in that area. Okay. And did you seize those? Not all of these were seized. Okay. Some of them were, and we'll see a photo of the ones that were seized. Okay. Is Can you describe photo 438? These were the items that were seized. So the shovel from the shovel over shovel the two axes, the post hole digger, and the hoe. Those were seized and handed over to Rexburg Police Department. Okay. And what did, can you describe what you observed in photo 416? These bricks were similar in nature to the bricks found near Tylee's grave site. We've already shown you pictures of those. These bricks were located to the north side of this smaller shed and we took samples of those bricks. And those would have been handed over to the Rexburg Police Department. All right. All right, Agent. Um, I'll speak with you about Site 1. Uh, can you tell us what we're looking at in photo 146? This is just an overall photo showing what, as you walk towards where JG's burial site is, which was our first burial site, the first 
um, human remains that were identified on June 9th, 2020, what it looked like as you start walking towards it. And it's in the northeast. It's right about here, the northeast corner of this pond. And what did you observe in photo 149? In 149, just you're, we're getting closer now. And so basically, it's easier to see when you're there, but it's taller vegetation, taller grass as vegetation around the burial. And then right here in the center, there's like a shorter vegetation on top of a raised berm. So as you're walking out there looking for a hidden grave, like that's, that's what you're looking for. And, and that was observed, there was a berm observable to you. Right. So if you're in, in person, then you, as you get closer to that, you would see a raised berm in this case. So there'd be a raised berm with less vegetation than the surrounding vegetation that you can see in this photo, how it's really high. And is this a, uh, and this photo is a photo of better, 153? Is, uh, can you describe what you're seeing there? This is a better photo because now we're getting closer. And so now you can see how high the vegetation is surrounding this part right here. And that, in, when you're in person, you can kind of get a better idea of the raised nature of this berm. And then you can see how this, just the vegetation's thinner up on top. And so being there, it just stands out to you like this is an odd, an odd location, an odd thing. In photo 156, uh, what is that a photo of? It's the same, what ends up being a burial. It's just closer up of that berm, just kind of showing you the, the shorter vegetation on top. In photo 157, what, what, uh, can you describe what you observed there? This is just an overall photo. It's kind of on the opposite side of the pond and our burial site was right over there somewhere. And, oh, oh, you're good. I was just gonna say, our, uh, from this picture, you can also see how uh, the fire pit area was over this way and the Tylee's grave site, it's hard to see, but it would be over that way. <clears throat> In photo 166, uh, what was going on there? So now we've kind of identified our area of where that berm was. And so again, what we want to do is we want to just process this layer by layer, uh, just going down. And if we see anything significant, again, we want to stop, take photographs, do those Pharaoh scans and just document how, how did whoever do this? How did they bury this person? And at this point, I mean, we honestly didn't know if this was a burial or not. But that's our, you know, we have to do this process and figure out what, what's here. And the, the oh. pink ribbon that we see, is that, is that where you've credited it off? That's just, yeah, that's just one of our perimeter markings. And then this area is going to be where the burial is. And we've already taken some of the vegetation off um, from above the burial site. Can you describe what we're seeing in 168? So now we've just gone another layer down. We've taken the vegetation off. And now you're starting to see stones kind of protruding through the, through the soil. Can you describe what we're seeing in photo 173? So now this starts to get really interesting because now we've got these stones, cement blocks that are just really precisely placed in this part of the yard. And you're starting to see cut roots, especially the bigger ones. Um, but you're starting to see cut roots and then the, these stones just precisely placed. And then this, this ends up being planks and we'll get to that. Um, but that's the significant, like something significant, that's significant. So we just want to stop, take photos, take scans. Um, but now that's, that's just screaming to me as a team leader, like something's odd here. Like this probably shouldn't be here. Uh, Mr. Wood, could we have a brief sidebar here? Yeah.
just finished the papers. I didn't even know. I had two. I had two other ones. That one must have gone to this. Cool, thanks for doing it. Thank you. All right, the court had a brief sidebar with counsel just to discuss uh, scheduling and where we're at for the day. It appears there's uh, still some time remaining with this witness, and so I think it would be best if we conclude for the day, and then you can continue again with additional direct examination of this witness in the morning, Mr. Wood. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Well, that will conclude the day's testimony then. <clears throat> I'll ask the jury again to please follow the continuing admonition of the court to not review this case in any kind of media coverage. Uh, don't look it up on the internet. Don't talk to anyone about it or talk to each other about it. Uh, we appreciate your continued service in this case. We'll start again in the morning at 830. We'll ask you to sign your juror acknowledgement as you do each day. And we appreciate you continuing to do that. And we will uh, break for the day and start again at 830 in the morning. All right, please.